Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue these series of videos on the philosophy of John Michael Greer in this second lecture in our group reading of his first book from all the way back in 1996, which was titled Paths of Wisdom. We will cover the second chapter of the text, which largely focuses on the theory of the four worlds. This is a part of the School of Fermentex. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. We also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. Alright, so as we get into the text itself, we find that in the second chapter, what really interests us about the ten spheres of being which were discovered on the Tree of Life in the first chapter is not just the fact that each one of these uh, ten levels of being, if you will, exists in its own right. What really interests us in the second chapter is the fact that there are certain connections between one of those spheres and another. And this really is crucial for our purposes because uh, the common sense of you would probably lead you to assume that even if you can hypothetically believe that other levels of being exist beyond the physical realm, um, you would assume that you're probably still stuck in the ordinary world of material reality so long as you're in this life. You might think that maybe in an afterlife you can transition to another realm, uh, but actually uh, this attitude misses the point that um, there actually is a technique which allows you to willfully transition from one location to another among the ten spheres of the tree of life. And that technique, which is very old and not really anything like what we call technology in the modern world, that old technique is called magic. Practitioners of Kabbalah magic in particular have found, in fact, that there's a total of 22 links from one location on the tree to another, which they then symbolize as the 22 paths of the tree of life. It's been concluded that each sphere on the tree connects to at least three others, though none of them can connect to all of the others at once. So if you really think about the title of this book, which is once again Paths of Wisdom, it would seem to be referring to these paths from one sphere to another, but there's a certain ambiguity, if you will, with regard to those paths. Greer argues in this chapter that you can um, symbolize them from two different perspectives, if you will. You can either see them individually as um, different sta uh, states of consciousness that you're able to undergo a uh, certain shift in awareness which the individual can realize. But if you uh, switch your perspective to the macro level, to the deep ecological level, you could see these paths as um, things which show you really the quote-unquote play of energies between one aspect of the universe and another, to use Greer's own wording. Each one of these paths has a number, but you might be surprised to learn that the counting starts at 11 rather than at 1. And the reason for this, as you might recall from the first video, is that the numbers 1 through 10 were already reserved for the spheres of the Tree of Life themselves. For this reason, Greer argues that there's really 22 different states of consciousness which are possible, rather than the 10 which you might have assumed you'd be limited to um, if you just read the first chapter. In addition to having a number, each one of these 22 states also has a letter from the Hebrew alphabet associated with it, which in turn begs the question of whether you could use this connection between states of consciousness and Hebrew alphabetic characters to read the uh, Hebrew scriptures themselves, uh, but with now a key to find hidden meanings below the surface of the text. Well, we certainly can do that, um, but we'll start by putting it to the test by seeing what happens if we do that with the most important Hebrew word of all, which is, of course, the word for God. However, if you actually read the Old Testament scriptures in the original Hebrew, as I do sometimes, you might recall seeing that God is usually referred to by euphemisms. Oftentimes, he's called Adonai or Elohim, and only very, very rarely is the proper name of God in the Old Testament which is transliterated into modern American English as Jehovah, actually used. And this was because the actual proper name of God was too holy to be spoken out loud. But if we put that to the test by taking a look at the alphabetic value in terms of Hermetic Kabbalah of that proper name, 
we might be surprised at what we find. Now, before we do that, we must acknowledge that the uh, traditional names of God, other than the proper name, um, can be counted at some 10, which are themselves correlated with 10 different spheres of the tree of life. But the proper name Jehovah, which was once again too holy pr to pronounce out loud in the Old Testament era, is not the name of any one specific sphere of the tree of life. Rather, that gives us the recursive name of the tree of life in its totality. Now, if we consider Jehovah in its written form, because ancient Hebrew only had letters for consonants rather than vowels, those were added later um, to aid with pronunciation after Hebrew was no longer spoken as a living language, um, you'll notice that uh, in the original, um, the name Jehovah could be written with just four letters, which were for us basically Y, H, V, and H. Now, not coincidentally, this is also a very ancient form of the Hebrew verb to be. But we can analyze each one of these letters as telling us something different about how the universe comes to be, or rather how it comes to manifest itself to us. The first letter, Yod, refers to the first spark of energy for creation. The second letter, He, refers to the environment in which the creation manifests itself. The third letter, Val, refers to the meeting of the two, which only then becomes an act of creation as such. At this point, the first two letters are in fact canceled out in a process, which leads us to the letter He, the final letter, but actually a repetition of a letter we already met. This repeated He now stands for the conclusion of the creative process and the establishment of a new pattern of balanced forces, to use Greer's own phrase. In this sense, we can see this final symbol as disclosing a solidification in which we have a return to the stability of being as we ordinarily understand it, but specifically a return to stability from out of a creative act which was itself defined by change which would seem to be the opposite of that sort of solidification or stability. We could say then that the same letter can occur twice within this sequence of characters without being redundant, because the second H, as it is transliterated into English characters, um, can be understood to be the daughter that receives the next change, which then leads us to a cycle in which there will be another generation to have that done for itself. Greer argues that this recurrence of the same letter twice within the same formula or sequence of characters tells us that the universe itself works in cycles. The universe really has its own memological shape, if you will, of a circle, which um, is very different from the way that we misinterpret the universe under the influence of modern technology and the ideology of progress. Greer has repeatedly warned his readers in the context of discussing peak oil and industrial civilization on, say, his Archdruid report and Ecosophia blogs, that the universe can only ever be temporarily coerced into following the kind of straight lines of progress which we demand of it. Even though that may work in the short term, it's only a matter of time before the universe inevitably returns to its most natural state of repeating a cyclical, never-ending process of creation and renewal, which can be observed even as early as an examination of these four letters of the proper name of God, or as the Hebrew word for being itself, in terms of even the amount of Kabbalah which we have learned thus far. But if we think about this in terms of telling us about the nature of God, we'll see that God is more of a process than a thing. He's more a verb than a noun, because the circular understanding of this sort of creation from one generational iteration to another tells us that we're gravely mistaken to think of God as simply a purity of being in the sense of the kind of static 
solidification which we deduce from our dealings with beings in the material realm, which, though truly real and not an illusion, is just the endpoint of a process of manifestation which reaches much further back than itself. For this reason, Julius Evola also noted in his book on the Hermetic Tradition that one would be mistaken to think of creation as a single event that happened a really long time ago in the caricature of the universe supposedly appearing in its totality from out of nothing simply through having the word of the Lord spoken out loud, let there be such and such. Instead, we find that creation is an ongoing process. It's constantly taking place. And it's something which we ourselves are therefore caught up in. Creation need not refer to the lofty event of having the entire universe materialized billions of years ago from out of nothing. For every single moment that we are aware of a material world in our ordinary experience, an act of creation is involved, which makes use, if you will, of all four of the things symbolized by the letters we have just reviewed. Or more specifically, we could say that our reality is constantly created by interactions between our awareness and an unknowable reality, to use Greer's own wording. Because these four letters represent the four steps between us and the supreme power lying behind our experience, it's closer to the truth to say that the four letters symbolize four different worlds. And these are four different worlds which we're always existing in, even if we don't realize it. In Kabbalah, these four worlds are known by the following names. First, there's Ashtiluth, which is the archetypal world in itself. Second, there's Briya, which is the creative world or reality in terms of the factors which condition our human experience as such. Then there's Yetzirah, which is the world of formation or the interaction between the archetypal and creative worlds we just discussed as one and two. This is the world in the sense of the very transformations undergone which later result in the flow of experience as we know it. For that reason, the remaining fourth world, called Asaya, is the material world, here explicitly understood to be a result of those transformations, but crucially, Greer acknowledges this to be the quote-unquote symbolic realm of existence that human beings, by their nature, inhabit. Now, lest the reader be skeptical that all four of these worlds are involved in the creation of even our most mundane experiences of the material world, uh, we can just consider Greer's own example of something as basic as a coffee mug, maybe the same mug sitting on your desk as you're watching this video or while you're reading this text, um, to illustrate how this works. More specifically, we can see how a coffee mug is actually a symbol of something else, despite seeming to simply be its own self. We might think that a coffee mug can't be a symbol because it's just the most brute sort of non-linguistic material objectivity which we have ready at hand. It's just a brute object which doesn't take us into the realm of anything like language, for it simply is what it is. Well, seeing how even that is a symbol will be useful, for it will reveal all of human thinking to be thoroughly and inherently symbolic in the sense that we're always caught up in using symbols even when we think we're not doing so. We don't even need any obscure theories from the occult to refute the common sense view that a coffee cup is a non-symbolic object that simply is there as the thing which it seems to be. For materialistic science alone, is enough to prove that this assumption, or as Greer would later call it, this figuration, is just that. The cup of coffee does not spontaneously appear as the coherent object which you perceive, for it only appears to you that way if it is figurated by you into that set of boundaries within the bundle of sense contents given to you by the five senses. This is something which we don't notice precisely because it's only successfully carried out if it is done so automatically that you don't have to realize that you're the one 
who's doing it. It's only if something goes wrong with that process of figuration or dividing the sense contents given to us into so many coherent objects with distinct identities, it's only if something goes wrong with that process that you'll notice that what you really perceive is just a buzzing confusion of so many different colors, noises, smells, and tactile sensations. This is something which might happen if you've ever had the experience of um, waking up in an unfamiliar hotel room, maybe in a country which you'd forgotten that you would even travel to, as I remember um, having a layover between uh, India and um, America in um, England, and uh, woke up with jet lag um, in a place which I didn't even realize for a few moments was the United Kingdom, and it's within that crucial delay between realizing where you are and what surrounds you and simply having this bundle of sense contents given to you, it's within that gap between the two that you realize that they only come to be formed into, say, the pieces of furniture within the hotel room around you by an act of figuration which you perform, uh, but which only really is done successfully if it seems to happen all on its own. However, it's not just the problem of figuration which reveals the coffee cup to be inherently symbolic, for materialistic science takes this much further back by showing us that even the image which we take for granted to be an object in the sense of the um, uh, visual sense contents which uh, are given even at the level of the most basic kind of phenomenal perception of objects around us, even these are themselves the end result of more basic physical processes. We can think about the way that light affects your eye, which then sends signals to your brain to form a particular kind of visual image in response to that stimulus. Science has confirmed that even things as basic as colors don't really exist, but they only appear the way that they do because of how this interplay of light to eye to brain processes unfold within us. So the object taken for granted is not an automatic given at all. It is instead a retroactive side effect of other more basic processes, which means that even the brute physical objects are quite literally symbols, even before any question of human language as such has been raised. However, once you enter into the realm of explicit linguistification by speaking a human language as such, like, say, modern American English, the figurations, which were already symbolic, come to have another layer of symbolization um, added on top of them. Now we have a dichotomy, if you will, between a figuration within perception and the word which refers to it from a second remove away. The latter are called abstractions. We can consider Greer's own example from a 2022 Ecosophia blog post of a, a pre-linguistic baby who learns to figure out the thing that feeds it every day into a coherent object, which is only later um, given the linguistic label bottle of milk, but is already known as that sort of thing even before it starts using language to refer to it now through two different levels of symbolization, both figuration and abstraction. Introducing abstraction to figuration means that the gap between the symbol and whatever is its ultimate referent will only widen, because everybody with the sense of sight can see the same cup of coffee with their eyes and will more or less form the same sort of image as a response to these underlying physical processes. But speakers of different languages will not only use different vocabulary, obviously, to refer to those apparently same things, they'll use even very different grammatical structures because of the vast differences between different types of languages. You consider analytic languages like modern American English that largely rely on word order versus synthetic languages so-called, like Sanskrit with many, many different inflections. Then there's the agglutinating languages like Sumerian, Turkish, Malay, Alum, Tamil, which basically stack morphemes on top of each other to build these long chains. Well, even with as great differences as those uh, between different languages in the um, ordinary sense of the term, we should not lose hope 
about our ability to know things, not just about this material world, but about the underlying processes of creation which lead to its manifestation in the first place. For the very interesting thing about magic, which once again um, uses observation and description to talk about not just things in the outer world, which natural sciences does, but um, those things which are experienced in the inner world, if we remember that distinction from the first video. Well, the interesting thing about that is um, the texts of the magical tradition, even um, from different languages, will of course use different um, surface level abstractions to talk about the things experienced in the inner world, but there's a remarkable consistency on a morphological level, if you will, um, with regard to those things being talked about. So once again, you might have different languages for these um, magical texts, some written in Latin, some written in Hebrew, some written in ancient Egyptian, uh, but the things they're talking about are clearly identifiable as having a certain consistency because they actually are able to reach down beyond the ordinary level of phenomenal experience of the material world to talk about those underlying processes of creation and the spiritual levels of experience, which once again, we can have a hope to directly experience even within this life through adopting the magical practices of, say, Kabbalah, which this book is concerned with. Now, as we return to the four worlds theory with this in mind, we can now see that it's not at all a stretch to say that there's always actually four different coffee cups in front of you, even when you think that there's just the one. First, there's obviously the cup as a material thing, something which is symbolically grasped in your ordinary stream of experience through an act of figuration. But then there's also the cup as the very transformations and interactions of world one uh, and two. Then there's the cup as it exists in each of those first two worlds, which are once again the archetypal world and the creative world, respectively. Or to put this somewhat more concretely, first there's the cup as you ordinarily perceive it as existing in the world of Asaya. Then there's the cup thought of in terms of the underlying conditions which allow that object to appear the way that it does. We can consider these conditions um, even on a materialist or scientific level. This is the pattern of light particles reaching your eyes. This is the electrical charges in your nervous system which signal your brain to respond to a visual stimuli in its environment by formulating a certain kind of visual image with, say, certain colors, etc. Then we can consider the given perceptions as put together by your mind. All of this together, we can consider as another cup, if you will, this cup existing in the world of Yetzirah. Next, there is the cup as it already exists in your mind, and specifically in your memory. This is the cup which can exist in your mind and memory because it exists from the basic idea of a cup in general. This is the idea of a cup as persisting in your memory in perhaps the sense that Deleuze might have understood it in the second synthesis of time in the book Difference and Repetition. It need not be an actual or identifiable cup, for it's more like the virtual from which the actual and identifiable cup is able to appear perhaps with the Platonic idea added in that this is the idea of the cup which transcends its instantiations. At any rate, we could consider the very structures of sensation and perception that make the experience of that cup possible for you as collectively making up the cup as it exists in the world of Bria. Finally, there is the cup as it exists in and of itself. This is the Kantian thing in itself, to use modern philosophical terms, or the thing about which the only thing you can know is that you can know nothing about it at all. This is the cup in the world of Atsiluth. 
Now, even from the very basic example of a coffee cup, we can extrapolate beyond that modest, simple object to uh, make generalizations about the way that even the universe itself works. And if we do that, it's not a stretch to say that there is actually always four universes. These are the noumenal universe of unknowability, which simply is a withdrawal from our ability to know, or more specifically, to symbolize it. Uh, then there's the universe qua the very potential to be perceived. Then there's the universe as the sum total of the processes of awareness of all the entities within it. And then finally, there's the universe as all of the images as reflected within consciousness, as symbolizing the material entities which populate the world in the most mundane sense. Now at this point, one might ask the very legitimate question how the four worlds we just covered relate to the ten levels of being as understood through the spheres of the Tree of Life. Greer is very careful to warn us, though, that we should not think of a given sphere as being limited to only one of these four worlds, although it is the case that they tend to be associated with one of the four by default. Malkuth, predictably, tends to be associated with the world of Asaya because both of these give us the ordinary state of consciousness and the universe of our everyday experience, in which physical material entities seem to be the only thing that's really real. The spheres from Yesod to Chesed, which are, once again, numbers 9 to 4, tend to be associated with the world of Yetzirah, because at these levels, reality appears as a constant process of interactions and changes. This is a kind of dance of transformation in which the dancers are understood to be imaginary, for only the dance is really real, to use Greer's own interesting metaphor. The spheres Chokma and Bina, which are numbers 3 and 2, tend to be associated with the world of Briya, because at these levels, reality seems to be primarily a matter of essential underlying patterns. And it's these patterns which are perhaps presupposed for the dance of Yetzirah to take place, because it takes its rhythm and its form from these underlying patterns patterns. Finally, there's the sphere of Keter, or number one, which tends to be associated with Atsiluth, because at this highest of all levels, all the phenomena of the experienced universe are seen to come directly out of the unknowable reality, which is symbolized in a very different sense by the three veils above Keter. And this will conclude our reading. Of the second chapter, I look forward to more discussion. Thank you.